I'm more than happy to be introducing Susan Beck. This is quite an honor for me. And earlier today, I just touched base with Susan to make sure you know that there wasn't something I should avoid or something like that. And Susan, unfortunately for me, perhaps, uh, gave me a very difficult task, and that was to keep her introduction short. And so I will certainly try to do that. But I can tell you with Susan, that is not an easy thing. She has an incredible record of achievement and a uh, great deal of, of uh, contribution to our department over the years. I'll give you some of the facts though, and then I urge you to look at her CV online under her webpage and you'll be pretty amazed at, <laughs> at uh, all of the other things that I can't uh, have time to, to mention here. Susan, uh, began her college education at the University of Utah and got a bachelor's degree in geolo geology there. She then went on and worked with Ron Brune and got a master's degree in structural geology also at the University of Utah. And that is one of the really important aspects of, of Susan's background. She, she is a really excellent geologist, a consummate geologist. She's taught uh, structure at the in the department and um, that let's say informs all of what she does with uh, with her geophysics so this is a real uh, achievement she graduated uh, then with a phd from the university of michigan in ann arbor in 1987 and then went to lawrence livermore uh, as a postdoc for a year or two i think before coming to the University of Arizona in 1990. So she's been around um, a long time, but in that time she has done remarkable things. She is really one of the department's superstars and uh, she deserves credit um, as one of the architects for building a truly outstanding department, uh, both as department chair for seven years within the Department of Geosciences, but always as a super solid geoscience citizen. She's been on every important committee in the department multiple times, usually as you know, a well contributing member as well as chairs of these committees. So she has always been a, a major um, contributor to, to what goes on in this department. She is also an amazing consensus builder and she has an amazing way of talking with people kind of casually behind the scenes. But uh, in the end, we all realize that we've been convinced that there are better things that we can do. So <laughs> she is quite amazing in that regard. In fact, um, she is really some someone that we should consider maybe the, the super glue uh, that holds the department together, as well as the rocket fuel that uh, propels us forward. She is really an awesome colleague. But beyond the U of A, uh, Susan is really recognized as an outstanding seismologist and has been um, awarded with many different um, <laughs> fellowships and, and NSF awards and other things, um, as well as achieving many different uh, um, awards. One of them is the George P. Willard Award from the Geological Society of America, which is an Im impressive uh, award, but she also has been uh, elected to uh, be a fellow of the Geological Society of America and uh, the uh, American Geophysical Union. These are really uh, serious recognitions of her great achievements. She has mentored uh, women particularly well within our department, but way beyond that, she is kind of a support person for, for all of us in, in various ways and really has been uh, a great uh, colleague to have. Um, let's see, I guess um, I am supposed to keep this short, so I'm leaving out most of, most of the good stuff. I mean, she, you know, she has statistics like uh, over 120 five uh, publications, peer-reviewed publications, by the way, uh, and numerous you know, other 
things that there are simply great achievements uh, for, for any scientist. Uh, she is globally recognized as one of the best seismologists, I think, and uh, we are very lucky to have her today. She's going to be talking to us um, about one of the things that uh, she has specialized in. She's probably most noted for her work in Turkey along the North Anatolian fault zone and for her work on subduction zones in South America. So uh, today we are very lucky to have our friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Susan Beck, who will be presenting to us a tale of two modern flat slabs along the South American subduction zone. So thank you for being great for all of us here, Susan. Well, thank you, Roy, uh, for that kind introduction. And I'll just jump in. Um, let me know if you can't see my slides. So I'm, I'm really glad to be here to, to talk to you today about the modern flat slabs. And this is a project that George Nat and I have been working on for some time, but particularly over the last decade or so. And there's a lot of contributions to that. A lot of the people shown here are former uh, students or current students. And it's been a long interest in ours I think in large part because of the Laramide flat slab that I sort of grew up with by early training. And when uh, I got here, and, and not right away, but at, at some point I thought, well, to really understand flat slabs, we need to look at modern examples where things are actually happening now. And seismology is a good tool for that because we can image what's below. The geologic record is not quite the same as in the Western US, but we've learned, I think, quite a bit over the last decade about at least the two flat slabs in South America I'm going to talk about. So probably you know in South America that there's a break in the arc magmatism. These red triangles are the arc active arc and there's a flat slab in Peru and there's a flat slab in Chile and Argentina. And these have been known for quite some time. And a lot of work has been done on what are the conditions that cause flat slabs. Uh, because about 10% of the subduction zones have flat or shallow subduction, but most of them don't. Um, but yet we see them throughout geologic history, or at least we infer that. And it's almost like these slabs flap in the wind and change their um, dip. So modeling and other kinds of studies have suggested that you need a positive buoyancy in the downgoing plate to get a, a flat slab. And there's different ways to do that. You might have a very young age for your oceanic lithosphere that's subducting. You might have thick oceanic crust that's low density that would contribute to that, or you might hydrate the downgoing lithosphere so that it's less dense. And you might do that with faults in the outer rise before they subduct. And, and so there's a number of ways that you could get that downgoing slab to be, um, to be, hyd or to be uh, positive buoyant uh, relative to the regions around it. Uh, the other thing that's often called on is some increase in trenchward motion of the overriding plate and maybe a weak mantle wedge, decreased athenospheric viscosity and some kind of suction force. And then you could break off the front uh, dense part of the frontal part of the slab to get it flat. I like working in South America because first of all, the age of the downgoing plate in this whole region is 35 to 40 million years roughly. Um, and so there's not big changes. So we can't really call upon uh, changes in the oceanic age to cause the flat subduction. Um, so that's one thing that's, that's rather nice. And then we see ridges such as the Nazca Ridge being subducted at the south end of the Peru flat slab and the Juan Fernandez Ridge being subducted. And uh, spatially they correlate nicely with the flat slab regions. But we also see that Akiki Ridge and I've just caught a piece of the Carnegie Ridge. And those two ridges um, are not, don't cause flat subduction and they don't um, shut off the arc magmatism. So it's a good place to sort of look at a long strike variations in, in all of this. But in addition to wanting to understand those favorable conditions, we also uh, wanna understand how coupled the upper plate is. And if so, uh, what's the response how coupled the downgoing plate is to the upper plate, and what's the response of the upper plate to that coupling? And then what about this basalt or, or um, basalt to eclogite transition that we think the oceanic crust goes through at some depth between 40 and 80 kilometers? 
again, depending on the temperature um, and that exact composition. And when that happens, is that where the slab begins to resubduct more steeply? And in normal subduction zones, often this transition is where the slab does uh, become a little more steep. There's a change in the orientation. So we kind of expect that to happen. And then what can we say about um, flat slabs and dehydration of the overriding mantle, continental lithosphere? Are there fluids coming off the slab like we might see in cartoons for the laramide? And this is probably one of the hardest things to get at. And then finally, how do slabs become unflat? You know, throughout geologic history, we see flat slabs and they're not flat. And we sort of brush over how they actually become unflat or get steepened up again. And so I want to uh, touch on that because I think we see evidence for, uh, I think we can answer a lot of these questions with work on these modern flat slabs. And of course, I'm going to use seismology as a tool because that's what we do in our research group. And I'm going to summarize a lot of studies over the years with some more recent things that we've put in and trying to uh, kind of look at what I think we've learned. So we'll jump in, you know, 2008 paper, this is sort of the state of looking at modern flat slabs, noticing that, you know, there's flat slabs and ridges going in and roughly changes in dip with the Carnegie Ridge sort of being anomalous where it's a big ridge with thick oceanic crust and not so much evidence for what uh, the slab does. But we're currently working in Ecuador at this, where this is being, where the Carnegie Ridge is being subducted. And indeed the slab is not flat, the arc is not shut off. Uh, so that adds a question, why isn't there flat slab here, but there is in these other places. So again, it's, it's a great place to look along strike. So how do we get our data? Well, I have to show some field pictures just because my geologic colleagues always do. And I don't want them to think that I never go in the field. Uh, but over the years, one of the reasons it, it's taken us a long time is we, we do have to do a fair bit of work to collect data. There's some existing data we can use, but not um, nearly enough. So we go down and we find, small, we find small towns where there's people that will allow us to put a station in their uh, courtyard or backyard. It usually requires having a lot of tea and mate or depending on where you're at. Then we ship tons and tons of equipment down. We test it all and we load up trucks, uh, many, many trucks and head out in the field and we dig holes, sometimes with a jackhammer, sometimes not. We put up solar panels. Uh, if we're up in the high Andes, we've got to get above the snow. So here's some of the, uh, this is a solar panel above the Argentina flat slab. We got all the equipment in boxes that we bury a sensor and electronics. And then we go every four to six months and pick up the data. It's getting recorded in this case on this little orange disc there. Sometimes it's on uh, flashcards. Um, but as you can see, it can take a long time to even do one station. And we've put in, in the Andes, um, over 500 stations our research group has. So it's uh, just to get data is a, a fair bit of work. So let's jump in and talk, talk uh, science. So I'm going to compare and contrast the uh, Peru subduction zone, the southern end of it, where the Nazca Ridge is subducting with Argentina and the Juan Fernandez Ridge. And these are just uh, several decades of ISC earthquake locations at Global Catalog for depths greater than 40 kilometers. And reds are shallow, greens are more intermediate, 100 to 150 kilometers depth, and then purples are deeper. And right away you see here, look at all of these green earthquakes, and those are all at around 100 to 120 kilometers. When you compare that to Peru, when you're south of the flat slab, you see the colors increase in, with depth. And these lines are the contours for the slab. Um, but as you go north to the flat slab, there's a lot less earthquakes in here. And this is a global catalog, but when we put stations right above these, we see the same thing. Very few earthquakes here, or at least a lot less than what we see here. So there's a big difference in the seismicity. And a lot of seismicity at this depth is thought to be related to embrittlement and dehydration reactions. So there's a lot of differences uh, just by looking at the seismicity. Well, here's Gucher's uh, plot from 1999 just to show you the Peru flat slab. And here's the Nazca Ridge coming in. It's really broad, uh, but this part of it in the north is thought to be uh, more buoyant because of a subducted Inca plateau. And that's based on a mirror image. 
So this is much different than the laramide, for example, where you have maybe one big ridge going down. And I'm gonna focus on the Peru, uh, the southern part of the Peru flat side where the Nazca Ridge is coming in and not so much uh, further north. And you can see the ridges and then the slab is sort of sagging here if you look at a uh, north-south cross section. I guess it's south to, to north. Okay, so let's jump in. Here's the southern end of the Peru Flat Slab, the Nazca Ridge. This pink area is uplifted coastal uh, uh, deposits that have been interpreted as a result of the buoyant Nazca Ridge subducting. And inboard of that is this Fitzgerald Arch. This is now plotting topography. And it's a very broad arch without uh, many faults. And of course, it gets into the Amazon. Uh, all these other symbols are seismic stations, some of which we've deployed, some of which other groups have deployed. And it's a great place to work because it's, some of it's near Cusco and there's a lot of um, ruins and terraces and, and things. We know the arc shut off right in this region uh, two to four million years ago. And again, we can see that the upper plate is responding uh, not with basement cord uplifts in this region, but with a very broad uh, uplift. So I'm not going to talk too much about techniques, but I just want to mention one, and that's receiver functions and common conversion point stacking that many of you, um, if you've seen talks by our group, have been familiar with. But basically, we can, if we have a station up here, we'll have a direct P wave that comes up and then a P to S conversion. And if we look at, do some processing and look at a receiver function um, with increasing time, like as shown here on the right, there will be an arrival that's a P to S conversion from something like the continental moho, that's a positive arrival and red. And then as we go deeper, there might be a decrease in velocity at, at the top of the oceanic crust, which would show up in blue as a, a decrease in velocity, and then another increase at the base of the oceanic crust. This method gives us a way to um, identify and estimate the depth to a discontinuity, but it doesn't tell us anything about absolute velocity. And of course, what we do is get many, many earthquakes recorded at stations at the surface, and they come up and they cross, and we make a volume and stack things um, in bins to reduce the noise, and then we migrate it with various uh, velocity models to try to get the best images of these discontinuities. So this next image is a receiver function image from that volume. We've just taken a slice across here where we've got a lot of seismic stations. Again, when you look at this, you can think of the red as an increase in velocity and blue as a decrease. And this, this strong high amplitude red arrival going through here uh, is, is the continental moho. And there's some low velocities in the crust. Um, but then, and there's a few earthquakes, but not a lot. These come from a, a study that we did uh, relocating earthquakes with, with all this data. And there's just not that many earthquakes, but there's a few. And then below that continental moho is another red, which we think is related to the um, oceanic slab moho. And then it ends abruptly right here, but the earthquakes continue. So this is where we think the basalt to eclogite transition occurs because once it's eclogite, there's not going to be a, a velocity increase. It's going to look like the background mantle. So this is a good way to identify where that transition happens. When you're back in here, the slab moho is very prominent because uh, there is a big increase in velocity at the oceanic moho. So this is our interpretation. The continental moho, it bows up here a little bit and then the slab moho, but we think the slab continues in part because of the earthquakes and in part because of other images I'll show you uh, that actually look at velocity. And then we see it resubduct way out here based on uh, teleseismic tomography. So this part of the slab still seems to be flat even though this basalt to eclogite transition is way back here. And we've got crust uh, thinning up in here. The oceanic uh, Nazca Ridge crust is about 18 kilometers thick, so it's very thick. So uh, this is work I should have said by Brandon Bishop a lot of it, and if we just contour up the top of this, uh, the oceanic slab moho and the continental slab uh, moho, 
there's 20 kilometers or less in this region of distance. And if the oceanic crust is 18 kilometers, then we're pretty confident in saying that this slab is right at the base of the crust. There is no mantle lithosphere here right now. Who knows, there may have been some in the past. And the other thing that uh, Brandon noticed was if, if you look at, take these same contours of the, the slab and overlay them, here's the 80 kilometer depth contour and 100, um, overlay them on some tomography, teleseismic tomography at a depth of 130 kilometers. What we see are red areas, which are, de are uh, negative perturbations. That means it's slower uh, than uh, nearby regions. And if it's blue, it's faster. These are perturbations, so they're not absolute velocity, but they're relative velocity. And there's a very, very low velocity below this um, slab uh, in, the, in the, the mantle. So that suggests to us that maybe one of the reasons you can keep that slab flat so far east is because you've got upwelling in the mantle below it, and it's a sub-slab mantle, even though that's probably, even though the oceanic crust is probably eclogite. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Um, if we look at crustal thickness um, throughout this whole region with lots of different kinds of data, this is what we see, the thick crust that you'd expect in the high Andes. But right here, it's still high elevations, but the crust thins dramatically to 45 kilometers or so, 40 to 50, instead of you know 65 to 70. And this is right where the ridge comes in. And um, you might think, well, the ridge used to come in up north and it's migrating south. But if you look at reconstructions, uh, this point on the ridge subduction goes, migrates back to this point at 4 million years. So it's coming in right through here. And we suggested that it's, it's uh, mechanically thinning or scraping off uh, the base of the crust. And if there was mantle lithosphere, it's, it's been removed. Of course, we can't say when it was removed. Uh, could have been removed long before the flat slab. Um, and so then the, the question is, well, if it's removing some of the, the base of the crust, where's that going and what's it doing? And one possibility takes us back to the Fitzgerald Arch and Brandon Bishop again looked at models like Peter Bird's model in the late 80s for the Laramide and suggested that that's what's happening here, that you have basically an indenture and it's, it's um, bulldozing crust under the arch and his calculation suggested that, you, that uh, all you'd have to do is uh, bulldoze in about five kilometer thickness of additional crust and you would get this broad uplift uh, that could, you could explain it. The uplift is consistent with the age of the flat slab and it's, it's very broad, it's not very high, 500 meters. Uh, but this would be a good mechanism to account for that. Other people have suggested dynamic topography, uh, but we couldn't really make that work very well. So in this case, the Peru flat slab seems to be modifying um, not just the mantle lithosphere, but the base of the crust and causing uh, broad uplifts rather than basement cord uplifts in this region where the ridge is subducting. Well, if you want to stand back and look at a, a broader, deeper view, uh, this is teleseismic tomography from Daniel Portner that just got published this year. And uh, again, it's perturbations. This is um, P wave velocities where blue is 5% fast and, and red is 5% slow, the darker colors. And you see a nice image, if you look at a cross section through the flat slab, of the Peru uh, slab being very steep, just rolling right over. And then perhaps um, it's uh, stagnating down below the transition zone in the upper mantle at a thousand kilometers or so. But I just want to call your attention to this very steep rollover. Here are earthquakes. This technique doesn't really image above 150 kilometers, uh, but we see this really nice rollover. Uh, Emily sees the same thing in her work with the S wave velocities. And this steep bend seems unusual. You know, it's almost a 90 degree bend in the slab. and, and um, people have pointed out to me over the years, well, how do you get a slab to bend like that? And I don't know the answer because in general, there's not a lot of small earthquakes there that suggest bending. But just last year, there was a magnitude eight earthquake uh, in this position of the bend, but further north. 
Um, and the suggestion there was that it, it was due to bending forces. Um, and this earthquake was at about 120 kilometers. So again, where the slab is going down in the oceanic lithosphere. And so perhaps it's bending, it doesn't produce a lot of small earthquakes, but every now and again, it's going to produce a magnitude eight. And eights are unusual for 120 kilometers deep. Well, we can also look at the surface wave uh, tomography. And again, everything's got a different color scale, but this is perturbations in the S-wave velocities now. So again, red is uh, slow velocities and blue are faster by plus or minus 4%. And in map view at a depth of 75 kilometers, we see a lot of blue for the flat slab, which we would expect. Um, and if we look at a cross section just south of the flat slab, D to D prime, uh, this is what it looks like. We see uh, a dipping blue zone that's consistent with a, a down going slab. Earthquakes are all at the top of the slab, either in the crust or upper mantle. And then we see um, slow velocities above the slab under the arc where these red triangles are. Uh, again, what we would expect, uh, this would be the uh, mantle wedge under here feeding uh, the arc. But as soon as we go north to C to C prime, uh, we see a very different image. We see that low velocity zone, just like we saw with the teleseismic tomography. We see the slab resubducting out here like we do with other methods. And then we see this blue flat area. It, it seems a little shallow. Uh, but it's probably the flat slab and the earthquakes are in it. Unfortunately, it doesn't continue on and, and there's maybe some reasons for that I won't, won't get into, but not too bad. But then when we go to B to B prime, uh, it's totally different. Uh, look at this pattern. It looks like the slab is, is dipping here, um, resubducting way back here near the coast. This is work um, that we did with Laura Wagner and her graduate students. Um, when she was at North Carolina. And uh, we went round and round on this, but it looks like at least the interpretation we, we've come up with so far is that this is the flat slab, uh, but it's broken and starting to resubduct. Now there's some earthquakes here that seem like they ought to be in the dark blue, but at any rate, there's light blue. So maybe it's still part of the flat slab uh, and it's breaking up. Um, this cross section is just north of the Nazca Ridge. So our thought was that this is really buoyant. It's sagging to the north, not so buoyant, and it's finally giving way and starting to resubduct back here. This is quite different than breaking off the front end, the frontal part of the slab. So one last thing that uh, more recently uh, I've been working on with Laura is trying to understand these uh, earthquakes so again, this is a map of earthquakes in the Peru flat slab. Here's the Nazca Ridge coming in. And if you look at a cross section where, where we've projected the earthquakes, a lot of earthquakes uh, to the south, a lot less here, but look at this gap. And that corresponds right where the Nazca Ridge is subducting. Um, and you can see the topography, this is uh, bathymetry um, on the, the Nazca Ridge. So, uh, why would you not get earthquakes here? Uh, and how does that relate to dehydration? Well, the idea, the hypothesis that we came up with for, for this paper was that if we look at a cross section, here's our oceanic crust of normal thickness in this pinkish color. And here's the over thickened Nazca Ridge. Uh, and here are all the earthquakes projected over and the blue is uh, hydrated mantle. So when you're off the ridge, you're getting all these earthquakes in, the, in the, the mantle below the oceanic crust because those regions are able to get hydrated. But what if when you have over thickened oceanic crust, it's not possible to have, uh, get the earthquakes because this was never, never hydrated. The outerized faults never made it deep enough. So you don't, you don't, uh, you've sort of buffered it with the over thickened crust. You haven't had water be able to penetrate. Uh, and you can look at PT diagrams uh, for depleted mantle and altered crust. And in general, we do think these earthquakes are probably in the, the mantle below the oceanic crust. And these are different regions where you might get reactions that would release water. And if we only knew the temperature, we'd have a much better handle on this. But it's likely a lot of it happens in this uh, two area. Uh, this corresponds to the base of the normal oceanic crust, and this is the base, the pink line is the base of the over thickened uh, Nazca 
ridge. So this is increasing pressure or increasing depth going on. At any rate, it's an interesting idea that uh, we've just published and, and hope to continue to work on. Well, finally, I'll just summarize some of these things about the southern end of the Prue flat slab, um, sort of trying to put it all in a cartoon. And uh, again, you can see this uh, low velocity zone under the slab, the basalt eclogite transition, well before the slab starts to resubduct. And this bulldozing effect of pushing crust that you've scraped off uh, under the Fitzcarraldt arch. Um, I won't read all this to you, but you get the idea that there's a lot of different processes going on. Now let's move to the Argentine flat slab. Um, this is a region that uh, I know many of you in tectonics have worked on. And basically um, the Juan Fernandez Ridge is coming in. This is the projection of it. These are seismic stations that we've deployed. And again, here's the arc to the north and the active arc to the south and region where uh, the arc is shut off. And uh, some very recent um, relocations that uh, we did with uh, Leopold Winkemer, a former student of mine, uh, are shown here. There's lot, this is based on a two-year deployment and there's thousands and thousands of earthquakes along the flat part of the slab. And then right around uh, 67 and a half to 68 degrees uh, west, it, it starts to resubduct. So whoops, it looks pretty normal. And then look at all these crustal earthquakes. We've tried to do the same thing in Peru and there's just not enough earthquakes. And they're deep, they go down to 40 kilometers. And these were relocated with a 3D velocity model. And then inboard of the ridge subduction, you can see these topographic highs, these are basement cord uplifts. Here's the edge of, of Pia de Palo in this upper photo. And here is standing in the middle of the inactive arc up in the frontal cordillera. And this region is made up of a number of terrain boundaries that got accreted um, back in the Ordovician. So it's had a, a long uh, geologic history as well. And, and we do think that we are seeing some of the terrain boundaries in some of our images. So right away, you can see how different it is than the Peru flat slab uh, subduction, both in the seismicity and in the response to overriding, uh, the overriding upper plate. Well, the arc uh, shut off, and this is a figure from a, a Pilger 2018 database. It's online, going from zero to 30 million years as a function of uh, longitude. So here's the arc going away, then sometime around 20 or 25 million years, it broadens out. These are magmatic ages, but they're not volumes. So you don't know how much volume any one of these dots are, kind of goes along. And then it really changes uh, starting uh, somewhere between five and 10 million years. And then here's the region where the arc just shuts off. And there's a little bit of really small volume uh, magmatic activity out to the east, but very small volumes. Um, but you can see that it's a relatively recent thing, but say five to six million years, you can be sure that the arc has, has shut off. So it hasn't been flat all that long, but maybe slightly longer than Peru. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about this area is we don't often get a chance to look at the outer rise earthquakes very much unless we're part of a big marine experiment. But we happen to have a lot of stations in Chile when a uh, 2001 outer rise earthquake happened that was quite large. And uh, Robert Fromm worked on this, um, getting focal mechanisms and relative relocations. So what he did was he did relative locations to the main shock, which most models suggested it was at about uh, 10 kilometers depth. And all the aftershocks were deeper. And here's the pattern, it almost looked like some conjugate faults. And the reason that's important is that this is probably one of the best examples where you can show that an outer rise earthquake actually ruptured uh, through a lot of the mantle lithosphere down to nearly 30 kilometers. And of course, these are the pathways and conduits that people talk about for providing uh, fluids into the um, mantle, uh, lithospheric mantle of the, of the downgoing slab. So we would expect that slab to have some, have some water in it as it goes down. Well, again, we can look at receiver functions and these are interesting, same as in Peru, we're looking for the continental moho uh, and we're looking for the oceanic moho and maybe the crustal thickness. 
anyway, this is the conversion for the uh, moho, continental moho. It's got some gaps in it. It's also got some steps that correspond to some terrain boundaries. Rarely do we see big steps in the moho. And although we can try to get rid of this with some uh, processing, um, it's pretty hard to get rid of it altogether. But even more interesting maybe is below, we see this blue on top of a red arrival, which we think is the top of the oceanic uh, crust. And this would be the slab oceanic crustal moho. And then it abruptly ends. The top uh, goes a little bit further east than the slab moho, but somewhere in here it, it disappears. So again, we can, we can look at whether this basalt eclogite transition that we think we're seeing corresponds to where the slab resubducts. Uh, but before I get to that, I just want to show you again some, some surface wave models. And here's one at a, a depth slice of 110, 120 kilometers. Uh, again, it's perturbations in um, the VS going from plus or minus 12%. And all these things have different scales, uh, and that's uh, it's partly related to how damp the uh, inversions are. But you can see the blue, we can see a fairly good uh, uh, signature of the flat slab. Uh, this is work done by Ryan Porter. And we can also look at now absolute velocities. I'll just show you one of his cross sections through here. And the scale is absolute velocity now, so it's kilometers per second. And it's a different scale for the crust than the mantle, otherwise it'd be hard to see things. And if we just first start with the mantle, uh, this blue through here we think is the, the slab. Um, and it, it looks pretty much like it should and that it starts to resubduct out here somewhere, uh, not too far from Pieta Palo, long before you get to Cordoba or the easternmost um, basement cord uplift in the region. And then we see the low S wave velocities and the, the uh, mantle wedge and probably corner flow in here. And we see the boundary between the craton and the, the, the lithosphere and the mantle uh, wedge, uh, sort of a shallow dip. Um, there's some slight differences in here of uh, faster S wave velocities here than here, but it's perhaps a bit subtle. And then we see some very high velocity lower crust up here, and especially where a lot of these earthquakes occur. And a cartoon uh, we put together at the time trying to explain all this was the slab comes down, it starts to resubduct. Um, but as it does, it bends and then it unbends. Oops. And where it uh, bends here, it's in compression, so there's less permeability. So even though it should be dehydrating, uh, fluids aren't getting up, and we've got cold, dry mantle. And, and this also comes from some other studies I haven't, haven't shown you. And then as you go further east, it does look like there's lower S-wave velocities that might be consistent with hydrated mantle. And there's some, perhaps some changes in VPVS that we've seen. Um, but that pattern is, is a, a little bit complicated. But in a, anyway, as the slab then begins to resubduct and it bends the other way, uh, you get, um, an, you, the slab is an extension, and so that can allow the fluids to get up uh, and hydrate at least some portion of the mantle lithosphere. But it certainly doesn't appear to just hydrate everything uh, uniformly. Well, uh, we took it another step and did a joint inversion with the receiver functions on the surface waves. And this was work done by uh, J.B. Andretti, uh, who was a visiting uh, grad student at the time, PhD student from Argentina um, that came and worked with us. And the nice thing about combining these is you get both absolute velocities and it highlights your discontinuity. So of course we saw a much better oceanic crust um, as well as a change in the velocity uh, above it with the purples being a little faster than the blue that's behind this lettering. And the next slide will show uh, our interpretation that was on the bottom, but I just wanted to blow it up. So again, here's our downgoing slab. Here's what we think is the, the drier mantle. It's not hydrated so much. And over here, it may be more hydrated. Here's our step in the moho that connects up with the surface, uh, one of the basement cord uplifts. But this also corresponds to one of the uh, terrain boundaries. And again, all of this deep earth earthquake, crustal earthquake, down to 40 kilometers. So it really suggests that this is pretty darn cold, which is maybe not too surprising. 
but it's very unusual to get earthquakes down to 40 kilometers in continental crust. Okay, now let's look at the slab, the bigger picture, the teleseismic tomography. This is a map slice of 300, at 320 kilometers depth. And again, the scale, it's P wave velocity perturbation. So faster is blue and slower is red. And here's our image of our slab at that depth coming through, but here's a gap or a hole. And this is quite pronounced um, and quite resolvable. Uh, I could show you a lot of uh, recovery tests that show that. And in cross section, it looks something like this. There's the flat slab, slab starting to subduct. There's a gap, the deeper part of the slab. And then we've got all this red material that we think is um, either things entrained going through or things coming up from the transition zone. But we think that mantle should be flowing through this if our interpretation is correct. Uh, and that would allow sub slab material to get above the slab. So how could we test that? Well, one way we thought um, was to look at anisotropy. If the mantle is flowing, maybe we can measure that. And so Colton Lenner, who was a postdoc at the time in the department with us, uh, uh, sort of took the lead on this. And looking at um, SKS phases arriving at these seismic stations, um, we could measure the difference between the polarized S wave, the SH and the SV. And we could see that south of this tear, they're all sort of parallel to the trench, almost north-south. As you come up into the tear, they rotate to be nearly horizontal. These lines uh, that go through each uh, station are the fast direction. So that's telling you how the olivine is aligned and the, the fast direction. And we don't know which direction it's flowing. We can't say it's flowing east or west, but that is the, the alignment. And then when you go north, these are stations from a different study, uh, data from a different study that, that we didn't collect, but in it, looking at those, they're kind of all over the place. Uh, but we still think that this suggests that we are seeing some mantle flow through this gap or hole or tear in the slab. And notice where it is. Um, it's below this, the slab, but it's kind of off on the side. Uh, and so again, the idea would be that the, the slab is buoyant and it's strongly coupled here. And then from slab pull, it's starting to tear this apart. Uh, and who knows if that tear is gonna continue or not, but it likely could. Uh, so it's pretty deep if you notice 200 to 400 kilometers depth. So it's not up here associated with the flat slab like in Peru, it's much, much deeper. And finally, if we just compare those two images uh, from Daniel's teleseismic tomography model, Here's the Peru flat slab and that steep dipping slab. Uh, it's almost like it's anchored in the lower mantle somehow. And then here is the Argentine or Pampian flat slab where it continues on down with a shallow dip and then heads off. Of course, we don't have stations in the Atlantic Ocean, so we can't uh, go much further than this. But the dips are quite different. So it does um, bring up you know, what controls the, the slab dip. And, and again, I'll say the ages of of the slab here are not drastically different. Well, um, I don't wanna to go too long, but I wanted to just say a couple of things about the Laramide flat slab um, and just very few. I know many of you are working on it and there's so many things you could talk about, but the basic idea is that there was probably, uh, if, if we just look at a map of the, the Western US and overlay some outline of the Shasky rise, which is in this red, showing the scale of it um, that's subducted here. And you can pick what angle you want based on when it was and what the convergence rate uh, you think was. And, and we don't know how far it goes, really, how far the flat slab goes. Here's Wyoming. Maybe it curves up and goes into Montana. We know there's basement cord uplifts up here. Some of my favorite ones are here in the the bear tooth. But at any rate, here's what it might look like. And here's some slab contours that we've overlaid. And we're not sure what's happening on the edges. There's lots of ideas for that. Um, but basically, in this region, uh, where it first goes in under the Mojave, it's fairly shallow. And then it really steepens up to where you get under Wyoming, and it's the slab is more than 200 kilometers depth at, at the time of, of this subduction. So there's a lot, obviously a lot of complications. 
but I would say um, that it's quite different than um, what we're looking at in South America. So perhaps the South American flat slabs are not quite the uh, analog that we thought they might have been a number of years ago. Um, of course, we, the slab is not there anymore, so we can't really go image it. Uh, but the scale is much larger, it's much deeper, um, and now a lot of uh, studies are being done with xenoliths to try to see what that upper mantle looks like. Uh, so in this case, the flat slab, uh, above the flat slab was a lot of continental mantle lithosphere before you got to the continental crust. Now perhaps back here where the slab was shallow and scraping things off uh, in the Mojave and even into uh, uh, Western Arizona, uh, this may be like Peru, where the slab was very shallow and um, uh, scraping off and, and mobilizing some of the crust. But once it got under the Colorado Plateau and further on, it was much, much deeper. And the other thing to note is that in hindsight, of course, we can see that this flat slab was flat for a long time, you know, maybe 20 million years, plus or minus. Others might know that number better. In South America, the arcs have shut off you know, in the last, roughly the last five million years. So those flat slabs are really in their early stages, and yet they're still breaking apart. And so what does modeling tell us? And there's an interesting point that I wanted to make with this, uh, is a modeling study of Claire Curry's group uh, for the Laramide. And of course, there's a lot of um, things to set, and that's why, the, the, you, you know, you can only generalize so much. But this thermomechanical modeling of the Farallon flat slab uh, has in it petrology, has phase changes. Um, so that's you know, quite, quite important. So in this case, you can see that there's normal subduction and then you've got this Shasky rise coming in that's over thickened, that's both, uh, that's uh, over thickened crust and Harzbergite. And then the frontal part of the slab breaks off and then it becomes flat. And the red is the eclogite. So that eclogite uh, transition in this model is very shallow. And of course, a lot of it depends on temperature. So uh, in this case, they can't call on um, that uh, delaying that transition far enough to get a flat slab way down at 200 kilometers. So you've got a lot of eclogite already in this slab. So you'd think it wouldn't be buoyant, but it's the Harzbergite layer that apparently is what uh, in part controls that. But in order to get that flat slab, you've got to break it off and then you've got to overcome that eclogite, that dense oceanic crust. Um, because in all of these models, that transition always happens at a much shallower depth than the flat slab. So that's another difference that I think we see between uh, the Laramide and the South American um, modern flat slabs. And then finally, again, there's other modeling studies that try to look at things like the oceanic crustal thickness and the age of the downgoing slab and uh, come up with a boundary between when it should be steep and when you could get flat subduction. And so I thought it would just be interesting to plot some of these uh, subducting ridges in South America on a plot like this. And there's a lot of parameters, for example, the convergence rate and the initial subduction angle is pretty shallow, 20 degrees. and um, and so on. So you could change some of these and you might get a different uh, curve. But in general, uh, a lot of the oceanic subducting slab is um, 35 to 40 million years. So here's the Juan Fernandez Ridge and here's the Nazca Ridge for their corresponding um, crustal thicknesses. The Inca, uh, the Ikiki Ridge, we don't really know how thick it is, so I got a big bar there. But for the Carnegie Ridge, uh, the central part of it's very thick and the, the flank of it, which is CR2, is thinner and it's much younger. So no matter what you do with other parameters, this should be flat according to the modeling. Nazca Ridge should be flat in that area. Juan Fernandez Ridge is on the edge, but if we actually, uh, this doesn't take into account hydrating the, the downgoing plate in the mantle part of the lithosphere, so that's probably gonna push it up. Uh, and the, the Akiki Ridge, maybe that's thinner crust than we think, oceanic crust, so it's gonna go down. But at any rate, you can look at these things, but it's not perfect because there's of course a lot more parameters that are important besides the slab age and the oceanic crustal thickness. So finally, this is my last slide. Um, 
I just wanted to go back to those questions at the beginning, and I know I've zoomed over a lot of stuff, uh, but what are the contributing factors in South America for these modern slabs, the, the overthickened oceanic crust and the hydration, um, and at least in Peru, the subslab low velocity material or upwelling has got to be what the, the major uh, contributing factors are. And of course, our interpretation is that these slabs are very strongly coupled where they're flat to the overriding plate, but the upper plate response can be variable. Uh, and why that is, is a longer uh, discussion, I guess. Um, but we don't always see the same kind of basement cord uplifts. And, but when we do see them, at least in Argentina, they're much further east or inland than where the slab is flat by hundreds of kilometers. So we can't just say the flat slab goes to the easternmost um, basement cord uplift, which in the case of Laramide, I guess, might be the, the Black Hills and South Dakota. And then it's a little more complicated to say how much this uh, basalt to eclogite transition in the oceanic crust um, is involved, but it seems to uh, enhance resubduction in the Pompeian flat slab, but it doesn't in the Peru flat slab. So it, it may be a factor, but it's not always the overriding factor. And slabs do probably dehydrate, but again, I think it's, it's probably a little more complicated and not such a simple pattern. Not only does the slab have to dehydrate, but it's got to find a pathway up to the overriding mantle lithosphere. And then finally, how do slabs become unflat? I never thought of a better word for that. How do they, they, they seem to tear and break up even at the early stages of Peru and Argentina where the flat slabs, um, at least in their current positions, are fairly, fairly young. And I think I'll stop there and uh, see if there are any questions. Okay, thank you, Sue. Let me, uh, I can moderate the questions here. Either uh, please just raise your hands if you uh, uh, click on the participants uh, button at the bottom of your Zoom, you can, um, uh, or actually, sorry, on the reactions, I guess. Or where is that? Oh, it's in, I believe I it's in the, yeah. Yeah. I, I, where, where is this? Um, let me see here. Well, either way, uh, you can also feel free to type your question in the chat and then I can convey that to Sue. Sue, I'm gonna start off with the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, so I'm kind of, and this is probably a little, uh, uh, I mean, outside the covered portion of your talk, but I'm kind of wondering, um, do you see, what, what kind of patterns do you see of um, a seismicity versus seismicity and do they correlate with, with the coupling that you infer uh, in, in terms of some of these, uh, uh, like these two flat slabs, do you see any different patterns in terms of the seismicity and do you, can you attribute that to the different levels of coupling between the plates uh, uh, in those two different regions? Yeah, I wish we could. So we see the big difference in seismicity of the slabs uh, in the two regions. It's hard to measure coupling. Um, you know, if I had to say, I'd say the coupling in Peru is stronger because you've actually removed material. In Argentina, the slab is below uh, some mantle lithosphere. So the crust might be 50 kilometers thick and the slab is down at 100. So you have at least 100 kilometers of lithosphere. But it's pretty hard to know how those stresses are transmitted uh, and how, you know, how to quantify that. So I'm not sure I can, uh, can answer that. I would say in both cases, we don't see earthquakes that look like they're shear between the plates like we do in a shallow subduction zone. So that you're deep, too deep for most earthquakes. So the only earthquakes you get have to be, for the most part, in the oceanic plate where they're much colder. And so uh, you could still get earthquakes and where you get uh, dehydration. Most people think, uh, 
those intermediate depth earthquakes are due to embrittlement and dehydration and almost a hydrofracking response. Uh, I think that's still up in the air because some people are questioning that, but they, they seem to correspond to depths where you're losing uh, hydrated minerals. And, uh, and so when you do that, there should be some water somewhere that does something. Thanks, Sue. Uh, thanks to also to Chris Harry for clarifying that hosts cannot see the raised hand button. That's why we had difficulty trying to find that button. But if you raise your hand, I can uh, uh, basically give you the, the screen. You can ask your question to, to Susan. Ananya has a question. Go ahead, Ananya. Hi, Sue. Hi. Um, I had a question about the basalt to eclogite transition that you mentioned. So you said that in one case, it may have contributed to resubduction and not in the other. Um, could you maybe explain that a little bit? I mean, I know that there's a density change. And so I would expect that that would contribute to resubduction, but where you did not observe it contributing to resubduction, what may have been the reason there? Yeah, so I sort of talked to that very simplistic and I know that transition has a range and um, different conditions, but the reason in Peru we don't think it's controlling it is because the slab stays flat. And the only thing we saw that could do that is that very low velocity below the slab. And a lot of these low velocities are thermal, so it's a warm region, it might be an upwelling. And that would add buoyancy below the slab. And in general, people haven't really talked much about uh, slab buoyancy uh, being anything but what's in the slab. But we're calling on it to be below the slab much deeper than you would normally think about. We're trying, we're trying to find a way to keep it flat. Because again, that big density change ought to make that slab pull just go right down. And that's sort of the, the reasoning that most people say, though, that's where it should happen, uh, is where the slabs resubduct. But in the case of Peru, it's, it's off by hundreds of kilometers. So we were called on to try to find a different explanation for that. Okay, so you're saying that it's basically the upwelling that's maybe canceling out the density change. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's okay. right. So you'd have to look okay. at the whole density structure much deeper than just the slab, which is what we usually do. Is we just usually worry about the slab and the surrounding region. But that, uh, low velocity anomaly in the mantle below the slab is right there. And I don't think that's a coincidence. Okay. Thanks, good question. Thanks for the answer. <laughs> I actually have a question. This is a pretty simple one, but that in that whole area, it seemed like the low velocity zone was much thicker, especially once the slab started to bend and go down um, as compared to, you showed both of Daniel's uh, teleseismic profiles, I suppose, and the slab is much thinner in the one. Did I not look at the scales properly? Or uh, no, that? that's right. When you look at the blue slab anomaly in Peru, it looks a lot thicker than it does in, to the south. And we've, we've, um, looked at that as to whether that can be some kind of an artifact or not. But, um, and you know, I don't know that Daniel's on the call, but uh, it constantly shows up. So in an earlier study, we did suggest that the slab had thickened in Peru relative to the south and uh, did some uh, calculations on that. I would, I think Daniel is a little bit leery to um, make too much of, of that. Uh, because of some of the things in, in tomography, some of the things you can get. Uh, but it's a really important question, and I'll tell you why. And that is because if you've seen these studies where people try to pull out the slabs and reconstruct things going back in time, uh, there's, they do them in Asia, they do them in South America out of, I think it's uh, Johnny Wu's group at University of Houston. They take those thick slabs that people see uh, especially from the global models, and they say the slab is all folded. And so when you unfold it, you get a huge amount of slab that you can pull out. And we don't get anything nearly as thick as the global models because we have better resolution. But we're cautious about those differences because we're not quite ready to say they're all folded. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, 
it does seem like we constantly get them to be slightly thicker. So that's a good, that's a good observation that I didn't want to get into. <laughs> Thank you. That. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. It has implications. Susan, uh, Prana Bindu uh, has a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Pete, I'll, I'll get you next after Prana oh, Bindu's okay. question. Go for yeah. it. Thanks. That's a nice talk. I just have a quick question. I probably have missed it, but uh, those magmatic gaps, uh, are those like correlatable with the subduction angle? For example, they are taking place at a further distance. Uh, I noticed that there are hydration uh, that you showed in some of the places, which may cause some of those small prisms, but I don't see on, on the Yeah, surface. so that the, the thinking is that where the slabs are flat, you don't have any corner flow. You don't have athenospheric flow. And in a normal, typical subduction zone, it, that would be where you release the water. It goes into the athenosphere and produces melt. But when you have a flat slab, even though you're releasing fluids, it's going into the mantle lithosphere. And so you might get some small volume melts, but it can't generate the big arc magmatism. Um, but people still think that it's hydrating, at least in some places, the mantle lithosphere. Uh, but once you close off that corner flow, that mantle wedge in the athenosphere, it, it seems to shut off any of the big stratovolcano arc magmatism that, that you see. And when it starts resubducting, it's, it's already dehydrated. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're thinking. There's a little bit of small volume, um, but you don't see, it's not like we see the big arc stratovolcanoes move inland and, and be right above the, 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 uh, where the slab is resubducting. There is a little bit of small uh, volumes of, of magmatism there, but not much, and particularly none that we can really find in Peru. So I think it does suggest that probably it's, it's uh, dehydrated. And of course, when the slabs flat slabs are gone or whatever they do, then we may see a big flare up in magmatism because there'll be a thinosphere coming in. Thanks. It's a good, good question. Interesting. Thanks. Go ahead. Can I go? Pete. Yeah, go Pete. ahead, Pete. Okay. Susan, um, I can't keep up with all this progress, it's so fast. It seems like the last time we talked, it was, it was quite different. Um, it, it looks like the slab penetration business is getting pretty, uh, pretty well resolved. I wonder if you have done any back, back calculations using plate velocities and directions to establish when slab penetration into the lower mantle did take place. Uh. I haven't done that, but it wouldn't be very long ago, I don't think. Um, and you're right, I should do it, you should do it. Uh, I'm thinking it'll be in the last, it seems like Daniel and I talked about this, it, it'd be within the last 20 million years or less uh, that it gets, uh, that those slab images get into the lower mantle. It depends where you pick the, the portion of the slab. Um, I guess if you went all the way east, like out under the Atlantic, where we see it, and pull that up, that would be that would be a bit older. But it's a good it'd be a good thing to do. And we've been really focusing, trying to get the best image as possible and look at resolution so that we can a, attack and address not attack in a, that sense, but address these ideas of how much slab you can pull out and uh, whether the slab is folded or not. Pretty recent. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So. Uh, That'd be a good conversation to have sometime. Just maybe to provide some context for everyone else, the, the reason that people are, one of the reasons people are interested in the slab penetration issue is that it's been suggested that once the subducting slab penetrates into the lower mantle, it becomes anchored and, and forms a hard wall against which the upper plate um, starts to starts to increasingly deform. And so some folks would argue that that's the time at which you should really start mountain building in a big way in, in a system like this. So it's important to a lot of other aspects of the Andes. And in fact, you might mention that, you know, that's one of the focuses of this new proposal that we just got funded with Pete and Barbara and Mihai and Eric and, and I, um, that we're very excited about as soon as COVID is over and we can head to the field again. We all are waiting anxiously and that's one of the things that we want to try to 
connect up is a shortening with the, some of the deeper structures and imaging that we've done with the seismology and that we're going to do in the future. Ananya, go ahead. Sorry, I don't want to hog all the time, but then I just have a follow-up question with respect to Pete's comment. So when you said that when the slab goes into the lower mantle, it sort of becomes an anchor, and that's because you think the lower mantle is more rigid? Uh, well, I, I don't know. I'm a, I, I hope we can talk about this sometime. Um, yeah. What I see in Peru is, is, you know, there's a lot of old ideas where slabs used to flatten out in the transition zone between 410 right. and 60, and we don't see that. But in Peru, it goes down and it seems to flatten out. And I know there are a number of studies that suggest there's a viscosity contrast at 1,000 to 1,100 kilometers depth. And so it looks to us like maybe that's impeding the slab to go further. But if you just look at that, if the slab used to be a shallow dip, you fix it in that lower mantle and you keep subducting, it's going to sort of roll over and go steep as if it's anchored. Now, maybe that's too simplistic of a way to think of it. When we go into Argentina and further south, it's got a shallow dip, but it doesn't ever quite have that same look. It's it's 30 degree dip in the upper mantle, goes right through, and then the dip shallows, but uh, as far as we can image, it doesn't really look like it stagnates or goes horizontal. So that might suggest that in that part of the mantle, there are some differences. I don't know if you call it strength. I would think of it as differences in viscosity somewhere that impede slabs going through. Uh, they could still go through with a, a viscosity increase, but maybe it slows them down and impedes them. And of course, if we could image further east under the Atlantic, you know, my guess is those slabs would probably go all the way down to the core mantle boundary. But of course, we don't have data from the Atlantic Ocean to, to uh, really look at that. But I think it does tell us something about the mantle. I'm just not 100% sure what. <laughs> hmm. I can sort of recall this study by Lowell Miyagi and Hauke Marquardt, uh, this mineral physics study where they actually showed, and I don't remember the details, but I think they were able to constrain the viscosity of, I'm guessing, Bridgmanite, because that's the most likely phase. Yeah. And then I think the conclusion is that the lower mantle is indeed more viscous than the upper mantle. So that would sort of explain this observation. Yeah, there, there's definitely a... a viscosity increase at 660. And, but I think, I, I think I've seen that paper where they also think that uh, with Bridge Mike, there's a, maybe an increase at this 1,100. It's not clear to me that that's a, a really symmetric global thing. Maybe it is, but it might not be. And so then it begs the question of why is it in some places and not others? And is it related to mantle convection somehow? Hmm. Okay. But we should have a talk about that sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Of a virtual yeah. coffee. And, absolutely, uh, I yeah. I know you know a lot more about the mantle than I do, so. Um, I'm not so sure about that, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're, we'll, we'll close here. We're about 10 minutes over, and uh, I'm going to hand over hosting um, duties to Marcus. I believe Marcus is there. Yep. Um, and thank you, Sue.